Welcome to Civil Discourse, a podcast where participants are free to share their ideas, empathize with other perspectives, and who intend to advance to a better solution to fix a societal ill. We will focus on topics that are particularly complicated. In a time where information is from sources more opinionated than ever, our mission is to find solutions and goals to accelerate the nation's progress with cultural impunity. I'm your host, Todd Furness. Thank you and welcome uh, to today's episode of Civil Discourse hosted by Todd Furness. I am Todd Furness and I appreciate your tuning in. Uh, as always, if you like the content you hear today or other content, please like, uh, share and subscribe. We welcome your support. Uh, none of the podcasts that I do are sponsored. Nobody pays anything to be here and uh, we don't pay anything to have them here. Uh, so this is just a genuine and hopefully thoughtful discussion of topics that we hope you find interesting. Um, today, I have have a fantastic guest, John Kirk, uh, and I'm really happy to have you here because we're going to talk about something that not many people know about. Um, so welcome, John. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to be here. Okay. So the first question I've got is <clears throat> every city you've lived in has been cold except for Richmond, Virginia, <laughs> and yet you are on the rowing team. Yes. So I'm just trying to figure out why on earth would you be on the rowing team in a cold city? I'm just thinking howling winds in Chicago. What yeah. the heck were you thinking there? Uh, it was a challenge. I was a junior in college and one of my friends needed, needed guys to, to build out the rowing team at Drake University because he had more women interested in and he needed to fill a, a boat. So I went there. I never rowed in my life. I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. There's not a not not the cradle of rowing. So uh, I went out and I realized that there were like five guys and, and like 25 women in the rowing team. And I said, these odds are pretty good. Let's um, to win. I mean, yeah, of course. So um, I began rowing, and I absolutely loved it. And rowing on the Des Moines River in October and November, um, that will that will create some white knuckles. I'm just telling you. It's a, it's a bracing experience. As it's always. a bracing experience. But as I tell anyone who's ever been in a boat, the the moment that you're rowing and you feel the the synergy of everyone rowing in that in that one moment it's truly effortless at the same time it's an incredible workout so it, there's a new term we sounds like we can create called roe return on endorphins yes 100 yeah, percent. there you go okay and so when you left Drake, you actually went into the insurance industry pretty much straight on right yeah i uh, i'm a third generation insurance family guy from my from my grandparents, my father to me. So I was just born into it. I, one of those things where someone says, I don't know how I got into insurance. I was told to do it, Todd. Um, but I got into the life insurance business right out of college because my, my father was in it, but didn't want to work in the family business. And it got me into the healthcare business pretty quickly thereafter, um, where I got my start at uh, what became United Healthcare of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, which was called Oxford Health Plans at the time. Very good, very good. And you lived in the thriving metropolis of Harf Hartford for a bit. Um, I spent a lot of time there. Yes, I did. I think everyone who's in this business needs to spend some time in Hartford and, and go through group school, which nobody trains anybody anymore in, in industry. But if you're in the insurance business, the way that we all got our start, everyone has to go to Hartford Insurance Mecca and do their time. It's I right. did my time. It's, uh, it's kind of like penance in advance. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Yes, 100%. All right, so let's dive into this uh, this fun topic around, let's start with healthcare, and then we're going to go into how we pay for it if we can. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, I have spent a lot of time talking to CEOs and CFOs about healthcare, and I love asking the question, you know, how do you pay for your healthcare costs? And a couple of things have come up on us on several occasions. In fact, as recently as last week, I was in management meetings um, down in San Antonio, and I asked the CEO, I said, hey, what was the one question that I asked that surprised you? And he said, nobody has ever asked me about my healthcare costs. And he said, I got to tell you, that's the one issue that really drives me crazy. He says, I turn over every single line item in my P&L every year. And the one area where I feel completely helpless is healthcare. 
And when I talk to CEOs, I usually say, well, you know, how do, where do you get your health care uh, coverage? And they usually say, well, I get it from Blue Cross, Blue Shield or United or somewhere else. And I said, yeah, you really don't. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, first of all, you get it from your company. And then I said, where does your company get it? And they, well, usually yeah, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. I said, no, I actually get it from a broker. And I said, who's the broker get it from? The carrier. Okay. And then who does the carrier actually negotiate with? The State Department of Insurance. So there's no privity of contract there. There's no ability of an individual company to have the kind of control over the expense item that they would have under other circumstances. Now, you've tried through your models to change that, to give uh, the end user a bit more control. Kind of talk about how, how you've approached it. Sure. So stepping back a little bit, I, was, I have a mentor in this business who was in the uh, property and casualty business of of um, helping organizations come together in, in a captive insurance company to manage their, their organizational risks differently and pay for them and fund them differently and just manage them differently. Okay, hold on now. I'm not as smart as you, so tell me what a captive means because I have a broad understanding at best. Sure. So the, an insurance captive is a, is a vehicle where organizations come together to share a pool of risk and they fund it with their own dollars instead of paying an insurance company, and they actively manage that pool. And what they really do, Todd, is try to push the overall insurance purchase to a higher level. So they manage um, a pool of funds more actively than what we would say the normal or, or standard insurance market would do. Okay, so let me see if I can synthesize that. So that means a bunch of folks get together, they throw money in the pot, and if bad things happen, the money in the pot funds the coverage of that cost. And if the cost is too high for the money in the pot or some other levels that they've set, they, then that risk is taken care of by another company called a reinsurance company. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So far, so good? So far, so good. Okay. So I learned through this mentor, and there were certain um, organizational leaders in this this property casualty workers' compensation type of captive, and they they began to ask the questions of, we too are frustrated about our healthcare costs, and nobody ever asks us about it. We're managing our business so well here doing this type of work with this type of organizational risk, but in healthcare, we don't seem to have a solution. Could we build it ourselves, and could we begin to manage these healthcare costs much like we manage every other operational process in our business. It, it just took my um, experience with them to, to see that there was a way that some organizational leaders said, I, I, we want to we tackle this. We want to wrestle with this and, and find out how we can actually do this better. And that was 2000, about 2008 or 2009. So what that does is it gives the, the companies more freedom to be more thoughtful about how they engage with themselves and with employees to improve the quality of their their health and their health care. Is that fair to say? Fair to say. They were in the standard market. A lot of these clients were in the standard market going with the, the normal insurance carriers, and I won't name names, but they were just trading out those logos and those names each and every year, hoping for different results. And it's the classic definition of insanity. But what I've learned and what in my experience with these these leaders is that to challenge that status quo, they had to deconstruct the model and rebuild it in their own eyes. And Todd, there's no secret sauce to it. It's just some organizational leaders want to manage things much better than the market manages it themselves. And that's really what this particular group did to give us the experience to, to, to want, know that it can be done. And it can be done really well. But it takes more than just one person to come together. And that's the essence of the group inside of these 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 leaders. So the idea is if you share this risk, then you can make the total cost ideally go down a little bit or uh, not suffer as much downside as yeah. you would if you did it by yourself. There's financial leverage and pooling together as as even I mean, it, you can pool together with four or five, 50 organizations and still find financial leverage. But you have to still manage what's in the pool. And that's the true difference maker. When we see CEOs and organizational leaders actually outperforming the healthcare market, it's what it's their mindset. They're committed to doing things a different way. They're data hungry. They want to understand what is what is the, the the leading indicator for them to change that outcome going forward. So this what you're really describing is 
it shouldn't be, but it's kind of a next generation leader, right? Somebody who actually says, I'm not intimidated by this yeah. rather than rather than shy away from it. I'm going to dive in and I'm going to get all the data I can. I'm going to make all the decisions I can. And, and I love it when people say you know, that very, very successful people are inherently control freaks because yeah. it so often works, right? It's like, of course they are, right? because if they're in control, if they measure stuff, then they can manage it. Yeah. I think another attribute of this entire group or those, those frustrated CEOs, and I've, I've sat in a number of boardrooms and a number of presentations and a number of angry phone calls about, are you kidding me? My renewal is X. And you never told me, I didn't know, all the emotions that come with that. And being part of an organization like these leaders who've come together in these groups, there's, a, there's counterintuitivity in their thinking. And I'll never forget one, one um, CFO, it was a law firm in, in downtown Denver, that's where I live, and, and we were describing this deconstruction of how to deconstruct a large insurance, find better value in supply chain, specifically around prescription drugs, pharmacy benefit management. Right. It's an easy one to pick off because it's a commoditized product for the most part. And he said, I, I get that we can break this down, John, but I don't it's counterintuitive to me to believe that I, a managing partner of a 300 employee law firm, can buy drugs at a lower unit cost than X large insurance company. And, and it's hard to say you can, and this is how it's done. They have to believe it. They want to have to, to, to go in and say, I can do this. But there's so much bias out there that that large, only large things can drive value in healthcare, it's just not true. So I, I'm gonna use this example, and I've, some people have may, may have heard this before, but um, it's the, the quintessential version of the activist. And my favorite example of this, the, the group that I hope gets more energized by whatever messages I put out in the marketplace than any other group is the soccer mom, right? So, uh, <laughs> I have a friend who is a soccer mom by definition. She fits straight into the demographic. And uh, she had just read main of my book and she said uh, she needed an MRI. And uh, so she goes in and she says, uh, you know, how much is this gonna cost? And the negotiated price with the insurance carrier for being an in-network, to get an in-network image was $3,200. And they said, but that's not all because you have to pay for the radiologist report, which is another $800. And she says, well, you know, my, my deductible is $3,000. Well, I just read this guy Furnace's book. He says I can negotiate with you on a cash price. What's your cash price for this? $562, all in, including the radiologist report. So she says, yeah, I'll do that. So she pays cash, and she keeps $2,438 in her pocket to spend on whatever else she wants. Right. But the idea, and this goes exactly to the heart of your point, right, which is, we are so ingrained with this idea that these big organizations with masses of insurance professionals who are specifically capable of negotiating prices to be in network because they're going to drive volumes of patients to these service providers is a complete myth when the soccer mom can go in and with one question get a price that's seven times better than the negotiated in network price yeah i if there's one thing we can do in the in this in in the time that we have to to make a, an impact in businesses, which make an impact on employees, which make an impact on families, is the notion that that the model that exists today, where someone else is negotiating in our behalf, and we're buying the value of that negotiating power that flows through this entire thing of sponsoring a healthcare benefit plan for your employees, is that. The model to 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 go direct to that actual quote unquote manufacturer is alive and well. And I encourage everyone to understand what the cash price is for this, even though it's an awkward conversation, right? We're 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 in a vulnerable position. We, we you know, it's weird to ask what the price is when your you know your knee hurts or your back hurts or, God forbid, something else is. But that's where we are today, Todd. And and what we want to do is empower. The businesses supporting healthcare, you know, 190 million people in the United States get their healthcare coverage through the workforce, through the employed workforce. 
but yet we're relying on a model that is such a legacy model that it's so damaging that we've, there are new models every single day. And it goes back to 1944 under FDR. Yeah. Yeah. And the new models are alive and well, and they are create value. And whether you're 50 employees, 500, 5,000, you can do this. And we're excited about that. So the idea of, of the captive specifically deals with the, the issue of payment of claims and managing the risk associated with those claims. But the business model includes things like, okay, how do I pay claims? What is the role of the third party administrator or the TPA? Used to be they might advocate a little bit. Now they just, I would assert, not, you're not saying this, I'm not putting yours in your mouth. They're kind of a bill paying function now that don't really negotiate on anybody's half. And then you've got the pharmacy benefits manager you mentioned earlier. They're kind of like the same thing, but they keep all the value that they're creating or 90% of the value. And then you've got these networks that are, that are under the uh, aegis of the big carriers. Um, but they can be rented out, right? You can you can use those and assign those and sign up for those and pay a price for that. So this idea of being a little bit more creative and thoughtful and engaged around designing your own model is a powerful one. So what's the what what is the resistance you get when you're talking to clients or prospects? I think that the resistance when we're trying to educate the buyer of one how to fund it differently. That's really kind of a dis the first discussion we talk about is this, like, how do you want to fund this, this potential, you know, this investment in your people? I always use these terms, like if you have 100 people that you're insuring in your healthcare plan, it's usually around eight to $10,000 per insured employee. So you're gonna spend 800,000 to a million dollars per 100 people, usually. And some people just wanna just write that monthly check for $83,000 a month to get us to a million dollars a year. and that's, they're on a fixed budget. It might be a government, it might be a nonprofit. They just might not want to have the risk of what else could happen. So funding is number one, because if you can't, if you want to just write a check to an insurance company, you're going to get what you get. It's a very passive way to, to, to write that check in most cases. Those who want to take some more risk and understand cash flow value of self-funding it, allows you to unlock these pieces. But again, it goes back to buying biases out there that the just large insurance has branded this so well, Todd, that when you, when you come in with an advisor to, a, to an organization and say, you can actually do things differently and better, but you have to deconstruct it and then redesign it this way, it just sounds hard. And it, it, there isn't a, there isn't a um, a brand. There's not a logo on the on the highway that we can see that that's my that's my company. But the leaders that we see who are outperforming the market like this will go. Well, I do this in other parts of my business. I get that. I'm taking advantage of certain supply chain elements. So help me understand that more. So I think it's a little bit of we have to educate the buyers differently going forward. That there's value in the in the, the supply chains versus just one industrial complex or another. Right. And that's my metaphor for large insurance. So this is a little bit like the IT world where you know, the, yeah, the age old thing, uh, the age old thing was, uh, you know, nobody ever got fired for, for buying IBM. Yes. Uh, but I think there's another piece to this, which is the organization. So we focus a lot on the CEO or the CFO in the conversation. But when you think about it, in order to change the model, the entire enterprise, the organization has to row in the same direction back oh, yeah. to your early days in that the HR leader has to understand what the HR responsibilities now include. The CFO and the comptroller have to do things differently. The CEO has to approve it. The board may need to get engaged in one way or another because it can be regarded as a capital expenditure. Um, so there are all sorts of things from a governance perspective. So uh, I, I, can, I can imagine that on the one hand you say, um, it's hard to understand, so I'm resistant to that. And also, I'm going to have to do something different that I don't really know what it is. And the reason I bring that up is because I think that means you have to have somebody on the front end that's a little bit, that knows how to do what I call strategic enterprise selling. In other words, they need to know how to, the broker, 
the guy on the front, the person on the front end has to know how to prepare the organization that they're selling into, how to receive that message. So have you experienced that? Have you observed that or with your, as, you, as you've been selling into clients uh, and communicating this message to clients, have you seen success born out of that kind of an engagement more? Yeah, I, there's not enough advisors out there that have adopted a, um, I, I'll say a continuum in, in their approach to the market. And there are many that have, but the industry lags, Todd, in, in I'll say that the, the training around this, it, it's a little bit of apprentice work that we're doing. There is no training for this new model. And the strategic advisor is going to say, how can we, how can we help you solve the problem? And we're gonna go work backwards. And it's hard. It's, it's hard. much more of a consultative sale, right? Much more consultative sale. It's not coming in with the big machine and say, here, do this. It's what do you want out of the machine? And right. I'll go help you build that more optimally right. than what it is today. And it absolutely is this Venn diagram of finance, operational um, change management. And we can't forget every single day we wake up these decisions we make impact a person and their families. That's exactly right. And that piece of it is also, I think, some bias in our business that in order for us to do better in healthcare costs, there is a squeezing of the balloon and, and a detriment to the employee by, by cost sharing, right? It's like, the only way you can do better is by loading more costs onto this, this already and I want to quote a friend of mine, Jamie, who uses this term, the Alice employee, the asset light income constrained employee, his acronym Alice. And it's so true that we have burdened this population with, with more cost sharing. And so what are they doing? They're not getting just normal healthcare services. Their, 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 their diabetes is suffering, whatever. And they are truly a deductible way sometimes from bankruptcy. Right. And this is the thing I don't think, you know, I, I, I think it's hard to come across. To me, the bond that really makes this work is inherently the trust that exists between the company, especially the key leaders in the company making the decision, and the broker. They, they need to genuinely believe and feel in their hearts that that broker has their interests ahead of their own and, and their, inter, their best interests in mind as they're navigating through this consultative sale, devising the best model possible because they're going to deliver higher quality outcomes to that patient, that employee, than they were before. And what surprises me, I can't understand this at all for the life of me, is the number of CEOs and the CFOs who say, I am so mad at my broker, gosh darn it. You know, I, they told me that my, my increase was only gonna be 30% this year. 30%, are you kidding me? No, none of my other costs have gone up that much. But they don't fire the broker, right? They, they still believe somehow that that's okay. And they don't understand that there are others out there that are genuinely working hard, people who are helping you, for example, genuinely working hard to devise a better system that will genuinely provide better care. Sure. And it goes back to that counterintuitive person that, that we were trying to talk to them about buying prescription drugs better than the large insurance company. The advisors who, who we work with have, a, have this consultative approach where <laughs> sometimes you can actually make these benefits the end user is receiving incredibly more rich and actually better in a process through incentives and through these direct to manufacturer opportunities. And, and frankly, Walmart, and, and I say this all the time, Walmart, Amazon, Home Depot, Lowe's, they, these large organizations have been doing these, it's called value-based insurance design for years, where the employee is in a position of an incentive with zero cost sometimes in these healthcare benefits and even actually getting a check to go pause the process, look at potential other alternatives and, and gain something in that process instead of this classic fulcrum where squeezing the balloon where the employee is always in a detriment for the company to do better from a cost standpoint. Right. And those advisors in the, the Venn diagram that are, are leading with to, we can actually improve benefits. 
to your employees with new thinking. We can actually reduce costs in the, in the entire model with new thinking and new channels. And oh, by the way, when you do that inside of a curated risk pool, and that's the business we're in, that, that classic, you know, the, the, the rising tide will lift all boats in, in, in the inverse for us, that we hope to create a more stable and uh, predictable risk pool. So I want to tie what you're describing into something that has been going around the finance industry, something I'm involved in uh, for the last 20 to 30 years, and it kind of got its origin, I want to say maybe 50 years ago in a McKinsey study, where it talked about um, the current term is conscious capitalism. Uh, now, what is conscious capitalism? Con the argument around conscious capitalism is that fundamentally, if you just focus on the shareholder, you're not going to perform as well over time as a company. But if you're able to better balance the interests of your various stakeholders, then you're going to perform sustainably well into perpetuity better than your competition. Now, what do I mean by stakeholders in this instance? What you just described was a model that improves the outcome for the employee, for the company, meaning the shareholder and the, and the shareholders, and the community, right, at large, because the community has healthier people living in it, right? So what I hear you saying is we've got a model that balances all of those interests better, and the enlightened leader will pursue this because the enlightened leader recognizes that it will lead to sustainably better performance over time, which is a win for everybody. Yeah, I, I, I look, like the way you articulated that that's ideally what can happen if you think about all the components that go into this, this investment in your people. And the enlightened leaders truly look at it as an investment versus managing a cost. Yeah. And when you do that, you're thinking far more about the impact down the road and what happens when, when that employee goes home at night and what happens when they wake up in the morning coming back to work. You know, are they completely stressed out about a, a $1,500 MRI that their child needs to have that they don't have $1,500 anywhere to spend on that? And what that means all the way back to what you just stated in the organization and then overall. And it's entirely possible, Todd, and it's happening every single day, not just in what we do. I see, I, I thrive on, on understanding who else is doing this great. And can we connect and yeah. can we come together and share these best practices about how we do this? And all the great ideas right now, they're not coming from a large insurance piece, but they're coming from everyday organizations saying, I think I found a better way. And we want to connect all those, all those points, all those people, all those leaders, because there are multiple leaders in this decision now, right? These are millions of dollars being traded every single day. It isn't just one person's decision anymore. And we want to connect these multiple viewpoints and insights and frankly pour gas on it for the betterment of what you just stated on the conscious side. It's, so it's it's agility and it's it's being nimble, uh, intellectually nimble on the part of the what I'm calling the enlightened leader. But I think uh, you can go a step further. One of the things that I see a lot of right now, because you know, like I said, I, I have a private equity business, um, is, and I'm old, right? So I have two things going for me. Experienced, <laughs> experienced. That's right. I'm, no, I'm old. Uh, but what I see is is that there are a lot of baby boomers. So my age people, I'm at the tail end of the baby boomers, who are now saying, hey, it's time for me to move aside and I want to either sell my company or give it to my kids. And they're typically smaller businesses, so less than five, certainly less than 5,000 employees as a general rule, um, who desperately need this help to be more innovative and more uh, selective in how they're managing their expense. But they also come with something else that I think is really critical. The reason they've been successful for so many years, in fact, frequently decades, if not generations, is that they have this culture of caring for their people, right? And so what I see happening is the large commercial entities that are more uh, entrenched and, and more almost uh, 
uh, ossified is they say that they're really interested in their people, but they don't, it's almost like lip service. Whereas the small family, smaller wow. family owned businesses, they genuinely care. So I had a conversation with uh, some folks recently where they said, yeah, <clears throat> um, you know, we had a fa- uh, an employee who had been with us for 30 years and his family uh, needed some help with some of the expenses associated with the funeral and some other stuff. And it's that's not in a policy anywhere. They just helped out. Do it. Because that's what you do, right? Yep. And that message gets you know, that gets out and and it shows that the company really cares. I think that's kind of what you're saying here too is, hey, we're going to show that we genuinely care for our people by putting in place real tools and real mechanisms that get you the best possible healthcare without further you know, squeezing your balloon. The, the founders of, on that note, the founders of, of my organization um, were a bunch of beverage distributors and they came together again, to start mostly in workers' compensation. And they had this mantra that, they, that they've, that and I was at early board meetings when the formation of this was happening, that a, um, they really were concerned about that worker going home safe at night. And you know, these beverage distributors, they drive huge trucks, they're driving all over Texas and all over the Midwest, and getting home safe at night was, was an incredible mission about why they began to manage their own risk and cost management in an insurance company that they founded and owned. And from that point, on the healthcare side, they said, we're only gonna get in the healthcare business if we can do it better, if we can make it better for our employees. And so this mantra became a safe employee can be a healthier employee as well. Meaning if we adopt safe policies and, and practices in our business and adopt, and at the time this was wellness, right? This was 13, 15 years ago. So they had this whole mission about a, a healthy worker should relate to a safer worker. And a safer worker should relate to a healthier worker. And so this was this kind of infinite loop that they had about strategic direction. And each one of these businesses were family owned businesses. And they absolutely had an empathy and an empathy DNA that was just just through the roof about their people. And so they made decisions differently. And they made decisions about their people. They made decisions about their their pool. And they knew other they knew other beverage distributors inside their circle. And that's really how how it began. But 100 percent on on how you're articulating consciousness in this and they were just tired of what was being delivered in the, in, the, in the standard market of costs go up, somebody else has to pay, we squeeze that, it goes the other side, and then it's not my problem, right? It's, right. It's, well, it actually is, it was their problem yeah. because it circled back in other ways in their business because they had data points. So fast forward to today, it's 15 years later, they have a data set of, of safe, and healthier workers from some of the things that they have, they've done. And they've curated most of these through their own data. And it's been fun to watch. It can be done. You don't have to be a beverage distributor to do this. You can do this in, inside of your businesses by unlocking this thinking and, and approaching it differently like this. And I get great joy when we get to be across from organizations who see this insurance benefit, and, and I don't want to put it to insurance, but these are life-changing things for, for many people when you can actually provide them something they can use. So the thing that's interesting to me is there's, there's something for everybody in here that, to pull away, meaning for the person who's just a number cruncher, bean counter type, CFO, no apologies to the CFOs, uh, and, well, not too much of an apology. Uh, they can say, look, this is all a hard cost number and I'm going to make some money. You know, this is a cost savings. That's all good. To the empathetic manager, it's, hey, no, no, we're going to do what's right for the people. And so that's good. Um, for the founder, there's something else, though. And I, I'm going to take advantage of this for just a second. Um, the way that great companies work for the first and maybe the second generation is they rely on values to make decisions. 
right? So what does that mean? And so I, I have this running model that says that wisdom or judgment is the application of your values to the fact pattern before you to make decisions. The great old story about Nordstrom's when they said, you know, the new employee comes in and says, well, what do you know? I need to, can, Mr. Nordstrom, can you show me the employee manual? Tell me how to do my job. And he said, what are you talking about? And he says, you know, the employee manual, the 50 page binder. He says, well, here's your, here's the answer. And he writes on the back of the business card, do what's right for the customer. That was the, right. the value. <clears throat> and so if you assume in the, that the, you get your values from, you know, a number of sources, uh, for me and my family, it's scripture in the dining room table, but for others, maybe something else. And then you learn how to apply that through an apprenticeship model, right? You see others do it well and you follow their lead and you see others do it wrong and you don't follow their lead. Um, but in order for that to work in a company, you have to rely on lore, right? Stories. Yeah. It's tribal in nature. Yeah. So at some point, in order to make the shift, you have to do something structurally that is a structural manifestation of the lore. In other words, I need to put in place a, a real genuine process that's really, or a model that's well thought out that embodies the culture we want to perpetuate, yeah. right? So if the answer is, yeah, I know what might be good for the employee, but I, I'm gonna suck it up. I'm gonna take the 30% increase to my healthcare costs and go with the same model versus no, I'm really gonna, I really wanna do what's best here. I'm gonna dig in. Hey, all my leadership team, we're gonna get in a room. We're gonna figure this out together. We're gonna pull in some experts. We're gonna think through it. And we're gonna see if we can come up with a better way that really genuinely reflects the culture we want to carry forward. Am I, am I overstating it? No, I, we see it in pockets. We do. We, we see those leaders who kind of have their, I'm mad as hell, not going to take it anymore moment and just say, all right, what can we do? And that is a, a little bit of just, you know, going from zero to a hundred in that, in that metaphor. And in, some do it that way, but I think we're in, an, we're in an adoption curve right now of, of this transition where we see it really work well. When we can articulate advocacy, we can articulate um, and, and, and share that this feels like a model like this can feel differently this way. And it can feel this w differently this way by someone handling an issue or a problem or that there's a new benefit that they can actually use through different ways and sources. And it does take a while to seep into the bedrock. It takes a while. There's no quick fix here, Todd. And what, what we see, even though we see some leaders say, I, I'm, I've had my mad as hell and I'm not going to take any more moment. It's organizational change. It's change management. We've got to let this sink in a little bit. And what I try to share with this leadership group that, that I get to be part of here and there in this decision making is that, how are you looking at this? Are you looking at this potential investment? Let's say you have 100 employees and you're spending a million dollars a year. You're going to spend 5 million on a, just a flat linear basis, right? In five years. Well, with compounding on your growth rates, you're not going to spend 5 million. You're going to spend eight, probably 8 million. And what does that look like in your business or whatever the number is on a compounding or growth rate? I'm still jarred at 8 million. Sorry. <laughs> right. So, and what, what do you want out of that 8 million? Yeah. And that's the time horizon in which we're trying to shift this discussion about, let's think about this in three-ish years. And I realize that there are budgets and I realize that there are stakeholders and investments all over the place, but the leaders are thinking about it in these time horizons. And yes, there's a stoplight at 12 months, there's a renewal, and sometimes it's ugly. But then there are the leaders who say three years, five years, 10 years, we've made a good decision. And those decisions are based in the fact that, that there are some new results happening. And those new results are kind of back to their people, right? It's just every single day, it's about the people that they're trying to provide this benefit, which is usually this top, second or third thing in their P&L. They want a different outcome, but they've got to look at it in a different time horizon, the impact of the people they're trying to impact with these decisions. And 
we see massive opportunity to change the model around the, the actual benefit away from co-pays deductibles and co-insurance. And in a model far more advocacy driven of like, what can we be doing for you? And it isn't just insurance. We see some really interesting innovations right now. And I'll just, if you'll give me 60 seconds on this topic, I was with a, a group in Washington, D.C. A, a couple of years ago, and it was a, um, the pharmacy um, analyst for Sanford Bernstein, the, the, the guy who's doing all the analysts for big pharma. He came in and spoke to our board and just talked about, here's what's going on in the pharma uh, supply chain in the next five to 10 years. And by the way, it's all about oncology management. And these drugs are hugely expensive. And then there's a few breakthrough drugs that'll be here and there, the Humira's and Enbrel's of the world. There's no more purple pill or, or cholesterol pills, right? I mean, those things were 10, 12 years ago. But what was really interesting in this data point about advocacy is he threw up a slide and he said, here are the top 15 501c3 foundations in the world. About 12 or 14 of them are in the United States. Number one is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Of the remaining 13, 14, 501c3 foundations in the United States, about 10 of them are tied to pharmaceutical manufacturers who are pulling profits from their organization, funding 501c3s for means qualified individuals to pay for their drugs. Yep. It's astounding. But the positive side of this is that there are new channels through these models of healthcare benefits at the employer level to find those dollars back to the employee, back to your plan. And this is what I'm talking about advocacy, these new channels to think differently. There are billions out there, Todd, and just drug support. There are billions at facility hospitals because of the Affordable Care Act. This, this little part of the Affordable Care Act called 501R requires hospitals to have a patient assistance financial plan that they will pay for these hospital visits. It's hard to find, but it's there and they're required to pay for means qualified individuals, no matter if they are in Medicaid, commercial insurance or uninsured. Yeah, now we, I did a podcast with Bill Hennessy from yes. Prater on this very topic. Yes. Uh, so my. A long answer to your short question around, I, I'm energized by what advocacy can mean in these healthcare plans now, outside of coinsurance, co-pays, deductibles, the usual tools that we think are the only methods by which to create change or, or to create differences. Now, you, you kind of went by it pretty quickly, but I wanted to circle back to something. It, once a plan, an and a more innovative approach is developed and a plan is developed and a new set of processes and providers is, are collectively developed and put in place, there's an education process that has to go on with the client to say, this is how you use this to make it work and to get the most out of it. Um, where I find most change management uh, exercises fail, first of all, they usually are very expensive and they usually don't produce what they are supposed to, is that they don't link the corporate values of the organization to the personal values of the employees and then tell them how they're going to support them with tools, templates, methodologies, and other things to make them successful. Usually what happens is somebody from one part of the organization says, hey, from now on, you're gonna do it this way and we're done with the conversation, uh, which is unproductive. But to say, hey, I care about you and I'm gonna try and put in place the best model for you and everybody else as is possible. And then for the employee to realize, hey, I wanna work for a company that, that cares about me, right? So there's an alignment of the values. And then to say, hey, here's how it's gonna work. You know, we're gonna give you this, this card that tells you where the most cost-effective uh, places to get services are on a cash price basis. We're gonna tell you um, uh, the quality of the service providers, the least complications, the best outcomes, and we're gonna fund it in a different way so it's lower cost. And I did a, a story on this where uh, I said, I don't know where the insurance industry came up with these words. They have no meaning outside of the insurance industry. Like this word premium, premium just simply means the first amount the patient pays. It's not a, it's not bigger than anything else. It's just the first amount. And then the deductible is the second amount the, cost, the, the patient pays. And then copay is the third amount the patient pays. Why do we use all these funny words? And the, oh, by the way, the other part of the copay, that's the other part that the patient pays because their patient, the insurance company is paying with the patient's money. So 
getting out of all that, that lexicon, it would be by itself an enormous benefit to the entire industry. Yeah, I, if there's, if there's a dream budget of mine is to have a team that, that can help our clients educate themselves and educate their own people. Because I think it's incredibly burdened on, if there's a financial leader makes a decision around this, the million dollars or $5 million, then it's, then, then in partnership, it's usually the people leader, someone in HR or someone at a people leadership level. And it's just, okay, I made this decision. You, you, you implement. And that role is, is a, it's a huge role, right? It's, it's helping the organization understand that there's a new, the new way of doing things. Okay. Well, I think a lot of the time that, that process just gets into the normal lane of the classic open enrollment that we're required to have every single year. And it becomes a very episodic one time dump the, the dump truck on, on November 15th. And here you go. We've got to create a far more, um, year-round messaging cycle, different modes of, of communication. Um, and we have to do a better job, a much better job on our side, helping the, the broker advisor, the, the end implementer, if you will, inside of organizations who yeah. are responsible for this, this, new, <laughs> this new way of, 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 a, of a leader saying, we can do this and I want to do this and go execute. Uh, we've got to do much better as an industry and ourselves included in that because it's, that's the last thing you want is having a, a, a business strategy that we've all agreed on fall flat because of the execution around communication. Right. So we need more oarsmen, more people with rope. Yeah, we need more people in the boat. Exactly. And, and because the rowing. waters are, are always choppy. <laughs> All right, so we have a unique opportunity today, John, in that uh, normally when I do podcasts of this nature, first of all, the, the, uh, the guests aren't nearly as good looking and charming as you are, but uh, we, do not, we do today have a little bit of an audience, and I would like to make it an option. If anybody would have any questions, we'd be happy to field them unless they come from Dave or not because he's an economist and that makes me nervous. But... Uh, if, if there are any Absolutely. questions, and who guy, what the, who, of course, Dave steps up first. So uh, we're happy to take questions. Yes, Mr. Ar Dr. Arnott. CEOs are successful because of their ability to make risk and return decisions. Yet when it comes to health insurance, they turn that decision over to a large insurance company. You're making them the offer to accept their own risk and return decisions in health insurance. Why don't they accept? What's your biggest resistance to the offer that you make? Mm. That's a very good question. I how much, told you how much time do we guy. have? <laughs> no, I think it, it, the essence of that question, I think, can be broken into a couple of parts. Whom do they seek advice from? It's rarely a, a really unilateral decision. They usually have a group of, of, of advisors, right? And what are those advisors? How do they think about solving that problem? Is one one way to think about how do we alter that is how, how does the advisor begin helping them solve that problem? Some advisors just say, I represent these large insurance organizations and this is the best you can do. And they believe them. Some advisors are gonna say, have you thought of alternate ways? The, the business has evolved dramatically. There's new ways to give employees new, 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 you know, new benefits and all these things around advocacy. I think it's one, their advisors. We've got to help them understand that there is a, there's a, a new way of thinking about this. Um, two, I think that they need to look at what models are working. Go to their peers, what's really working. There are case studies after case studies after case studies of organizations that have brought all this in-house, to your point and they've just managed the you know what out of it. And when they do that, the returns are completely there. I don't know if there's enough of that information out there for them to, to say, wow, here's a case study. We see it, we see it like this. I wish there'd be more um, self-learning about that. And then the third would be back to this, this bias around s volume and scale. There's this, persistent a persistent uh, notion out there that the only way to attack this is is a specific leverage of a discount of a of a price 
that is the value of something in, in healthcare. And it's largely the insurance industry perpetuates that this is the only way that things can be done. And it's simply not true. And unfortunately, there's a persistent notion around that, that, that's, that, that you're going to um, not have that value if you choose alternate methods. I'm, being, I'm trying to be kind, Todd, and use my words. I think there's a, if I can augment that, I think there's a structural bias. If you think about it, the number one place for somebody to rise through the ranks and become the CEO is almost never the benefits manager. Not yet, Todd. Let's be optimistic. Not yet. I mean, not yet, exactly. So, but you take a look at somebody who's managed supply chain, somebody who's managed sales, the CFO, even, God forbid, the the general counsel is going to be ahead of the benefits manager as a CEO candidate. So I think what happens is if you ask them what's the increased cost of nickel as a supply chain cost line item, they'll get, the CEO can tell you that answer. But if you said what's the increase in the cost of an MRI this year, not a single person, not a single CEO is going to be able to answer that question because they'd rather hand it off. And I like to say that it's usually an Oberlin grad, the liberal arts major, you know, who majored in poetry. They're the ones who get the, the assignment. Um, but I don't want to pick on Oberlin. There are lots of good people there. But uh, the, I think a lot of CEOs just get anxious about it. They don't understand it. They don't want to dig in. And so I, I think it genuinely does take an enlightened CEO who says, I'm going to go dig in and see what I can understand about this. And I'm going to disaggregate the model and put together a better one. Hey, that, uh, say- Wife of Dave Arnott, I just want to oh. say. So it's like a family <laughs> thing here. It's okay. Yes. Um, that's, uh, say uh, there's a group, um, a company that has 100 employees. Is there a way that they can step into this one step at a time? Say this year we're going to do, I don't know, dental and vision and life with this. Next year we're going to look at, you know, some drugs or whatever. Or yeah. is it jumping in? No, the, and the question is around, you know, how, how can we, how can we uh, gradually potentially, you know, get into something like this? 100% yes. We see organizations who, are, are just buying insurance, again, from the large insurance company, there's rarely a data set that, that comes from that transaction. The insurance company would argue, we're taking all the risk, it's all, all our information in most markets. And what I would counsel anyone there is just say, take the next step to partially self-insure and just get some information. Do you have, I'm working with an organization right now in Florida 210 employees. It's a, it's a family owned organization and they have one individual that is not allowing this to happen because they, they have a particular drug and that costs a million dollars. So you need information to guide the next point. And so you can take a model of one step, get some information and then begin to, to say, what is the next step after that? Um, I highly recommend that because jumping in without a lot of information, I, we deal with, the, with, with insurance rating, all, they're going to be very conservative and you may not have economic value right out of the gate. So partially self-insuring with a large insurance carrier is a great next step and it happens all the time because you then would get a data set. It's not completely rich, but you're going to get enough to get you to the next step. Well, and you, uh, under ERISA, you actually, uh, the company can get their own data. You may have to fi- write a letter to them and demand it, but you can get under ERISA. And if you, anybody who wants a, a copy of a letter to send, I'm happy to provide it to them. But that would give you the data that supports what John is saying and gives you another leg up. So it's, it can be incremental, as, as John mentioned. I think that's a great point is you just start, just get started because I think started. the other piece of that, which John didn't highlight, but which is critically important is it starts preparing the organization for a new model, right? They don't go in jarred by the process itself, but rather incrementally going into a model that says, hey, we've got to do things a little bit differently. And that's good. And I, if I can just, just tag on that one point, Many organizations are afraid of this, this word HIPAA and this word of protected health information or PHI. And it's like, it is a, it's almost a kryptonite for many leaders who, who potentially just falsely don't understand that they actually are entitled to that information 
it's de-identified. It's not John Kirk and John Kirk's record. It is a de-identified male. I'm what I think I just turned 32, something like that. Um, but that de-identified information is the actionable point around what we could or could not do with a group of these individuals, a cohort of these individuals, and, and that's how data begins to drive action. So the leader, the enlightened leaders, using your term, Todd, inside of all these models, there's no silver bullet out there that says, just go do this. It's the enlightened leaders who take the action from the information they're given and do something with it. And it's okay to actually possess that information and act on it. And it is a little awkward for some organizational leaders at an HR level or even a finance level to say, our advisors said that this particular person is now on a half a million dollar drug and we can call them and tell them that we can source this drug from a 501c3 foundation for zero cost and I'm going to make that phone call? The answer is yes. And usually the other response on the other end of the phone is, thank you for helping me. If, uh, and it's usually tearful. It usually is. And that is the, the consciousness of all of this laid out in front of us is that these little steps around getting information from a self-funded plan allows you to, to make new decisions for new outcomes. And feel good about having done so. Yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, and so it, you know, going, getting back to the lower question, do that once and it will be remembered for a generation, right? I mean, that's the kind of impact that would have. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, could you speak a little bit to, uh, for companies that are smaller with uh, limited resources in the in the HR department, uh, what kind of um, extra work, if any, uh, typically comes on an HR department when you make this type of a move, and how is that typically handled in smaller companies that you've seen? Yeah, it, I mean, let's just say what it is. When you deconstruct the model and information becomes part of that, right? Because that's really what we're talking about. Not only financially funding this thing, because that and alone is a new business process for most financial leaders, either controllers, either CFOs, you name it. But for HR, who leads typically the benefits function, it could be, it, it means usually four or five more vendor relations, transactions, someone's upset because the new vendor of this thing didn't do their job or something fell down. It's, it's a messy business. There's no way to say it any better. I don't know how to say it other than some organizations just rise, rise to, the, to the opportunity and say, wow. I mean, we work, we work as an organization that has over a thousand employees and they have about two and a half people in their HR team that handle this. That's all they do. And so we rarely see, as I always like to say, HR is not getting any more bodies. There's rarely someone else coming in to support this new thing. But there are opportunities abound about learning what all these things are. And it's reinsurance and it's, it's stop loss and it's new data and there's feeds to multiple vendors. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question other than acknowledging that it is a lot, it's more work, but the work becomes part of the strategy because the strategy from the leadership down is that can we create a new outcome if we have new process? And that new process is, a, is adopting a, 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 a technology stack, like Todd, Todd articulated, instead of one big box, it's, it's a bunch of functions. What we're trying to do inside of the business that we're doing is we, we, oper we operate and manage risk pools. We're trying to create best practices among users. And it's so one thing that, that, I'd, that we want to strengthen is to help you find peers to, to flatten the adoption curve and, and increase the efficiencies. We don't do that enough in our business. I feel like that most plans are a plan of one and they don't have anybody else to talk to. Well, in our world, we're trying to create a little more around best practices. We're not there yet, but um, I would rely on your advisor and their team like no other as well. Because 
the advisors who understand this have teams built for it. And they, they've, they've, done the, they've done the iterations year after year after year. Um, and then start reaching out to other peers and saying, how do you do this? And, and all I would say there is lean into, if this is a new platform for your organization, lean into all the partners and say, I need help. And I know you would probably do that, but those who sit back and get frustrated, we, we see it. These things don't work that well. Those who lean in and create some new processes and, and share some new data and some new insights and new learnings, because sometimes things break. Sometimes these things don't go that well because one person might say, this, are you kidding me? This was just, I got this weird phone call from HR about my wife and da 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 But I wanna say, if we look back in this time horizon of three years, five years, we're doing more good than potentially breaking things that might fall off, fall off the shelf. So I don't know if I answered your question other than we're trying to create an, a network of benefits and HR leaders who can connect with each other around that. And there's in the earlier remarks, we talked a little bit about the idea of a, of a truly consultative broker. Um, I would, and I, I'm going to infuriate a few people here, I'm sure, but most brokers come in maybe once or twice and buy you lunch a third time the, or the course of the year. They come in right before renewal to tell you that your price is going to go up and they come in for open enrollment to collect the forms where they're going to get paid a bunch of money on a commission basis for the next year until they have to do it all over again. So I think the truly consultative broker will be there year round. And they want to be helpful. They want to be relied on. They want to be an extension of your HR team and your benefits team so that they can understand how to better benefit you, how to provide additional value. That's, the tr that's a true value-added relationship. And I, I would encourage you to rely on them as an extension of your team because the other thing that's going to be happening is they're going to have best visibility into best practices across the sum of their clients, their whole portfolio of clients. They're not just looking to you, whereas by contrast, you don't have a whole bunch of folks that you can look to if your organization is small, or your benefits team is small, to say, hey, what's, what are best practices in our industry? Well, our industry is us, right? And so you just get to look around at your own employee base and how you've done in the past, and that's not really a big enough uh, reservoir of knowledge. So lean on your broker. You know, we have some folks here from KNS that are very good, and I would encourage you to look to people like that who are trying to make a difference in the industry and cut a different path, not only by working with you know, guys like John, but also by changing the nature of the engagement with the client. And that's a whole different thing. But rely on your broker. They should be earning their fee every single day. And you should remind them of that. And if you'd like, you can use my name and say, Todd told me you're supposed to be earning your dollar <clears throat> every single day. And I'm going to go back and tell him you didn't. So anything else? Okay. Well, John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Too. me. This really enjoyed the an conversation. Absolute joy for me. Um, and I can tell, you know, I, it's not often you get to say, say this, but I would say you not only are you an insurance guy, but you're probably, you've conveyed to me anyway, a great sense of empathy for the people you're trying to help. Not just the employees or the shareholders, but I mean the employers or the shareholders, but genuinely the employees. I think you believe, and you've conveyed to me anyway, that you believe in your heart of hearts that this is an opportunity. An opportunity. There are new ways to oppor and new opportunities to deliver real value that mean real things to real people at the end of that uh, uh, value chain. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank really you. Great to see you, and thank you guys for coming today. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Civil Discourse. To learn more about today's topic or our guest, visit www.the60percentsolution.com or www.tfip.group.